All right, we are back with the gang, and today we are extending the light of consciousness, so you better pay attention. And we're starting with Alan, who has found information about Binance. Binance, one of the world's largest crypto exchange brokers, et cetera, et cetera, um, prides itself on being a, I don't know, an upholder of cryptocurrency values in which there are cryptocurrency values yes of course it has values well in the from, sense that you can make money and it goes up is there well, some other uh, yeah. value <laughs> yes yes but it also pays lip service to no government interference and uh no taxes transactions and uh all that other libertarian hogwash the one i keep hearing they're going to bank the unbanked somehow the poor starving people are going to be saved because they have Bitcoin. I've never understood this part. Oh, yes. The people who don't even have computers or access to cell phones or cell phone networks. Yes, that's right. Somehow they're going, somehow the poor starving masses are saying, boy, if only I had Bitcoin, that would solve my problems. Well, you know, it's just another one of these techno utopias, Bitcoin yeah. and all these cryptocurrencies. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, news about Binance really exposes the lie to all of that because as much as the cryptocurrency um, proselytizers would uh, like to have you believe that uh, there's no possibility of government interference in cryptocurrency and that um, people are now liberated from fiat currencies and government oversight. In fact, what appears to have happened in Russia is that Binance has more or less collaborated with the FSB. They had a series of meetings in which um, Binance apparently uh, agreed with the FSB and the Russian government to conduct some or to share uh, transaction information and oh. account information. And this, of course, is focused especially on the Putin uh, uh, critic um Navalny Navalny yes thank you mm -hmm. who uh, is now imprisoned but uh I, I guess it's, it's still enough of a concern for the FSB that uh, they want to monitor all cryptocurrency transactions within Russia now one big um aspect of the story is that the Russian oligarchs have been trying to move their money out of the country in part using uh cryptocurrency I don't know what uh, the FSB is doing about that, but thanks to Binance, which is the world's largest exchange, if I'm not mistaken, they will the FSB will have a much easier time performing that monitoring. It also occurs to me that with control over the internet, as these countries often have, um, you know, it seems like it would be possible to either. Uh, block people's access to exchanges entirely um, and or funnel them to one exchange that you wanted them to go to by making it the only one available. Yeah, yeah. All right. And really, you know, to be fair, in America, it's essentially the same. I mean, Coinbase is totally hand in hand with the US government. That's why this idea of escaping government oversight with your crypto is uh, largely been exposed to be fake. Anyway, so uh, Microsoft, uh, I didn't realize this, Microsoft's number one fastest growing division is security. And I'm thinking, Microsoft security, what's that? And it's their equivalent of CloudFront. It's, they have an Azure Splunk clone, uh, which monitors your Azure traffic, and that is huge. Like in Azure is the big money maker, and the big product on Azure is the security products to secure Azure. So um, Microsoft security business is considered very big. This kind of reminds me of when I went to CCDC and they talked about IBM security consulting business, which I hadn't known before that. But anyway, um, that's interesting. I know a lot of people are attached to Microsoft shops and they're pretty much all moving to Azure and they don't really trust Amazon or anybody else with the Windows-based stuff. So Microsoft does have a, uh, a good product there and kind of a monopoly handle on it. And Caitlin has found bugs in Homeland Security. Well, not me personally, but apparently there was a 
uh, Department of Homeland Security Hackathon. So good news, everyone. Uh, hackers found over 100 vulnerabilities in DHS systems, 27 of which were deemed critical. And these were around the entire time. Uh, so <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much the extent of, of the story here. So the story is by Tech Radar. Uh, it was written by Siad. Um, oh, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this person's last name. There's there's umlauts and everything in it, but um, <laughs> there's, but yeah, they found. But uh, Saad uh, Saad's article here is absolutely fantastic. Um, and so the DHS had a hackathon. They gave away $125,600 to for all the discoveries made, um, and there were a lot of discoveries. Uh, so, you know, I've been saying this for a long time, and for some reason, people don't believe me, but the best way to secure your network is just to have people hack all the time, have, have your stuff just try to be hacked, like, 24-7, um, and that's how you get things, you know, secure, but for some reason, people think that I'm crazy. <laughs> I don't know, that's becoming more or less a mainstream position. Yeah, yeah, it's becoming very mainstream. I'm glad to see my, my opinions are finally, finally being taken seriously for once. Yeah, yeah. All right, and Liz has got Zoom bombing. Yeah, uh, you know, the um, headline of this story is from an LA Times article uh, entitled uh, $85 million payment okayed in Zoom bombing case that included porn and Bible study class. I mean, I think that could, you know, potentially liven up your Bible study class, but apparently people had some problems with for some reason. So uh, I, I was kind of surprised to read this article um, in that uh, the there was a, 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 a civil case moving through the um, courts here in Northern California uh, against Zoom, and it was a class action suit um, on behalf of users basically during the pandemic, I believe it said in the article, it was 20, uh, yeah, March to May um, of 2020. Uh, and uh, essentially it was covering um, schools, uh, churches, et cetera, who um, had been holding meetings over Zoom and, and uh, they had gotten Zoom bombed. So I was, pretty surprised that they got such a huge payout on this. Of course, you know, that uh, equi that equates to very little money per uh, class action participant in this article. They mentioned it was like $29 a piece, but I uh, uh, thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, you know, um, this is the sort of thing that, A, it's, I, I in a way, I, I kind of, uh, uh, some part of me felt bad for Zoom because this basically what happened with the pandemic was they uh, hit a um, uh, basically a sheer incline of of scale that they were not prepared for. I mean, they they were immediately just inundated with users uh, due to the pandemic, which they weren't ready for. And uh, of course, you know, whenever a service. Um, acquire such a huge user base uh, in a short amount of time like that becomes really popular. It's going to become a massive target. So um, they definitely weren't ready. On the other hand, this kind of thing is intriguing to me because it's, it's the kind of stick that is going to cause um, uh, vendors to take security more seriously for their products. So, um, you know, yeah. unfortunately they don't care until there's a, there are major consequences like this. So. Yeah. And this is what I'm glad to see. I'm seeing more and more of these lawsuits where they sue for a company saying your inadequate security led to us getting hacked. Like you sue a contractor that puts your roof on wrong and it leaks. Yep. And that's a good sign really. It means yeah. we're beginning to standardize on like some security practices that you should be able to expect. Yes. And this is the kind, exactly the kind of thing that, you know, we talk a lot in the industry about moving security to the left and, and, and incorporating it into the design process, building it into our systems earlier rather than as a band-aid uh, after, after, the, after everything's built. So I think, I think this is a positive, we're going to be a positive trend in that regard. 
Yeah. All right. And so we're back to, yep, we are. We're back to Alan with WikiLeaks. I yes, haven't heard much about them in years, really. Right. And WikiLeaks and Julian Assange seem to have mostly faded from the public consciousness. But in light of the renewed Russian invasion of Ukraine, there's been something of a reckoning happening in, let's say, geopolitics or public policy circles or strategic thinking circles about um, how analysts got Russia so wrong and the role of certain enablers, shall we call them, in um, American and European media and what their role has been. And that examination has extended to Julian Assange and um, WikiLeaks too. And it's entirely justified. So I, I've dredged up this article from uh, 2017 from Vox, which is perhaps reads more like an opinion piece than a proper journalistic article, but it's more like a, a compendium of all of the um, Russia-related actions that WikiLeaks took over the years, um, including some items that I either didn't know about or had entirely forgotten. Um, and one of those, it concerns a fellow by the name of Israel Shamir, who was at one time a, I don't know what you would call him, not employee, but uh, very much a very active member of WikiLeaks, who in 2010 went to the government, actually traveled to the country of Belarus, and while there, handed over a collection of leaks that uh, WikiLeaks had not released publicly, but it was a US intelligence intercept that included the names and identities of a number of Belarusian uh, dissidents, political dissidents. And these people were subsequently rounded up by the secret police, the KGB in Belarus, who worked for Lukashenko, the dictator there. And uh, they were tortured and uh, some of them were killed as a result of this. So this was a case of WikiLeaks Directly, directly participating in political repression that led to, uh, to deaths. But that's not the only uh, incident, certainly, that WikiLeaks was involved with. It, it's also since come to light that uh, WikiLeaks has been, of course, instrumental in leaking documents that were helpful to the Trump campaign, um, and that these were passed on by Russian intelligence agents, and that uh, US intelligence has identified how that came about, but uh, I don't know if US intelligence has ever publicly released all the details of that. Um, and also uh, um, the fact that Julian Assange at one point was working for RT, the Russian propaganda media outlet. Um, he had a series of interviews that um, I don't know, of various figures uh, that uh, he then uh, that were then broadcast on RT and he was getting paid for this all along. So it really does make one wonder um, just whose side WikiLeaks was on and Julian Assange. He always claimed to be about releasing information um, about uh, taking off the, the covers of secrecy and making governments more uh, open and transparent. But uh, when somebody is working at the behest of, or on behalf of, or passing information onto repressive governments, that's really not a good look at all. And that really does seem to expose the lie of the whole enterprise in the first place. Yep. And when you're taking just random uh, donations of stolen material, you're begging to be used by intelligence agencies. Yes, that too. Although DDoS Secrets has perhaps threaded that needle more successfully than uh, WikiLeaks. Yeah, there's a few others out there, but you don't hear much of them now. But the end result, I think, of WikiLeaks is all the major press organizations opened their special encrypted channels so you can leak directly to them. And I must say, the main leaks I'm seeing now are all these leaks that obviously come from the January 6th committee, which um, are probably serving as propaganda for the Democrats, but it is kind of revealing it to be exactly what Republicans said it was, basically a paid commercial campaign event for the Democrats. I'm not sure if you can call the truth propaganda. Oh, well. 
Oh, I guess, I guess you, but I mean, the point is it's, uh, it's very strange. They, they seize these documents and then leak them. <laughs> it's, it's a disturbing policy. Well, it's been the practice of Capitol Hill for, since time immemorial. It may be. And that's why I wonder what is the point of that committee? It's not a trial. It doesn't have any consequences. It's just a way to gather information to then leak it. It's, it's a little hard to understand. Yes, but if the Justice Department continues on its current path of not really doing too much and uh, succeeding in only uh, securing convictions of participants that amount to house arrest for four months, then perhaps it is necessary to shine a brighter light. Yes, it's something in the line of uh, vigilante justice or desperation measure or something. Yeah. Anyway, so... Uh, then I get to what I think is the big story, which is Jack Dorsey says, this is great that Elon Musk took over Twitter. You should all stop complaining. He is the singular solution I trust to run Twitter. And he said, uh, there, come on, where is it? Oh, now this, there we are. He said, um, Elon is the singular solution I trust. I trust his mission to extend the light of consciousness. So there you go. A bunch of people I saw are freaking out that Elon Musk bought Twitter and they think something bad is going to happen and he's not a good guy. But this is Jack. Now, for those overly cynical people who might question this, apparently the real uh, Jack also got paid a billion dollars as part of the deal. So that might possibly color his friendly feeling towards uh Elon, maybe it's only 800 million, but it's a lot of money. Anyway, um, so, you know, Elon Musk bought Twitter. I've been watching the security community freak out. People are saying, we've got to leave. He's going to ruin it. It's all over. And I'm thinking, why does anybody care? I mean, some billionaire owns your company. Billionaires own everything. They float above you a million miles like God. Who cares which billionaire owns the plot of land you're on? But anyway, they all think Elon Musk is going to do something god awful to Twitter. But the thing he says he's going to do is try to make Twitter actually make some money, which doesn't seem like a bad thing to me. And the thing everyone is so afraid of is he'll let Trump back on. Now, Trump has said he's not going to get back on because he's going to get on Truth Social. But I got on Truth Social. Nothing's happening there. Trump is not showing up. And I don't think uh, Truth Social stock is falling. It's, Truth Social has no reason to exist. If, what is Truth Social? Truth Social is different. Trump's... Uh, Trump's clone of Twitter to be the right wing stuff because some right wing people got through off Twitter. So that was going to be his alternative social media. So it's just a clone of Twitter. They just copied Mastodon, the open source Twitter code, <laughs> Twitter, and they made a social network and they had, it took them forever to get it going, but it's going now. And when you go on there, there's nothing but they recommend a bunch of Fox News people. And then they have like ordinary Twitter news kind of stuff. So, but it would have Trump on it, supposedly. But I think Trump is going to find out that that thing is going nowhere and he's going to have to come back to Twitter. And Elon would probably let Trump back on Twitter. That's my opinion. He hasn't made an official statement. And then I thought it was funny because a political playbook had an article saying, you know, the Republicans have already made it clear. Republican leaders have said, we sure hope they don't let Trump back on Twitter because right now the Republicans are poised to win big in the midterms. They said the only thing that could really screw us up is if Trump got back on Twitter and started saying stupid things all the time and inflamed the Democrats to vote against us. So all the people, all the left-wing people freaking out about Musk buying Twitter, I'm not sure this is a bad thing at all. <laughs> I think Musk buying Twitter and letting Trump back on might be the best thing that could happen. <laughs> anyway, we're, uh, the only people I think that have a grievance are of course the Twitter employees who were hoping to have stock options be worth something. and. I don't know exactly how this works. I think, Kate, Liz, you know better than me, but I mean, when a company goes private, your stock options are suddenly worth nothing, right? And so that's that's got to be a letdown for them. Anyway, so uh, that's the tempest in a teapot of Twitter management. And Caitlin has got Ubuntu. Yes, uh, Ubuntu 22.04 is finally out. So omg uh, ubuntu.com or .co.uk as an article written by Joey Snedden, talking about all the great new features in 2204. Uh, so for people that are unaware of the Ubuntu schedule, basically every two years, Ubuntu releases its big version, its long-term support release that 
people, it's basically the standard Linux that everyone else kind of bases their Linux off of, kind of, sort of. I know there's a bunch of Arch and Fedora, uh, uh, Red Hat, and, um, and of course Debian, which is upstream of Ubuntu. Right, right. And Debian is more, you know, people are gonna. I, I know, I know. But, but Ubuntu is the big one that's sort of like the standard. Okay. Um, and it's like where they base important derivatives like Hannah Montana Linux on. Yes, exactly. So like Hannah Montana Linux is based off of Ubuntu. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So <laughs> now that we've started a Linux play more, uh, let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the new features in 2204. Uh, there's some new file manager features that are completely forgettable. Uh, there's a horizontal app launcher as opposed to just a vertical one. I don't, what? Uh, there's a new logo. Um, this reminds me of Windows 11 so far. Yeah, yeah. There's Oh, there's new screenshot stuff going on. And I'm always happy to get new, easier screenshot stuff for my work. So, um, oh, and they might have more RDP support. And, and that that's it. So I, you know, these releases are so incremental. You know, you would really hope that Ubuntu would really kind of make every, you know, two-year release or every four-year release like really something special. Uh, but every time, it's just this incremental step forward. Well, I remember a few years ago they had revolutions like putting ads on the desktop. That was a hit. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. And they, changing they... the desktop into a three D rotating cube that didn't work, like like Vista. The cube was awesome. Okay, let's let's make sense. let's 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 clear the air here. Linux desktop UI peaked uh, during the the three D uh, compiz phase with the three D desktop, and like you could you could put your desktop in like space, and like you had like the wobbly windows. That was peak UI design right there, and we've been downhill ever since. Well, uh, I've been corrected. Okay. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, I don't think they're going to get extra Ubuntu sales from your, your review there. But anyway, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's very incremental. And the Ubuntu UI, the stand up UI, I don't think it still appeals to, to many people. I know when I have to choose an Ubuntu version, I specifically avoid the, the mainstream Ubuntu and go for something like Xubuntu or Lubuntu or even Ubuntu Mate, just anything other than the, the straight up Ubuntu system. And that was the thing that made Ubuntu great to begin with is that they had this very simple, very customizable user interface that was Linux for human beings. You know, it was just very simple to use, uh, but they they kind of messed it up uh, almost a decade ago now and they haven't fixed it. And I was thinking like, okay, one, you know, even, even Windows is like, okay, Windows 8 was a mistake, you, you know, let's go back. They haven't done that with Ubuntu, and it's it's frustrating to see it's kind of, you know, flounder about. Well, you know, I switched to headless Debian long ago, no UI at all, and that's, that's the way to go. That works just fine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, headless, no no UI, all you need is a teletype interface. There you go. That's right. You're, you're done. It takes me right back to my original, original computing in like 1974, the way God intended it to be. Right, yes. Except they now have lowercase letters which is a mistake, but nobody listens to me. But I do teach COBOL. In fact, maybe I'll propose COBOL to DEF CON again. They might have, they turned it down last year. Can you believe that? They I cannot down believe my COBOL. That. I cannot believe that they would turn down your COBOL. Maybe I'll try again. Anyway, all right. So Liz has got uh, banned books. Yeah, so uh, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, response to the, um, uh, uh, Fahrenheit 451 style uh, book banning going on in certain places um, like parts of Texas, but they don't have the monopoly. It's going on all over. I, in fact, I saw some di school district that actually banned for Fahrenheit 451. And well, like, that's, that's like too meta. Yeah, and it really is. Uh, but uh, I was reading this other list too that was some of the banned books were stuff like The Handmaid's Tale and V for Vendetta. Uh, yep. So, you know, we wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want the kids reading those. But uh, a lot about of the Hunger Games, the Hunger but, Games would seem like you better ban it too while you're on that stick. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, even stuff that uh, I remember reading in school that was pretty classic, like uh, Black Like Me, I bet that stuff wouldn't make the cut now because- I think I've seen that one on the band list, yeah. Yeah, I imagine that would be, even though it was 
written by a Texan who yeah. <laughs> grew up during Jim Crow, but you know, what would he know? Uh, so there, all these books are being banned in various school districts. And uh, as part of the response to that, um, the uh, Brooklyn Public Library set up a program where any teen in the US uh, can get a library card. Anybody between the ages of 13 and 21 can get a digital library card for Brooklyn Public Library and have access to all the digital catalogs. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And I hope I hope the word gets out to, to kids who may be living in those places and they can have access to read everything. Um, well, obviously, I remember, we need you know, to I remember, ban the internet. What's up? Obviously, we need to ban the internet. Yeah, sure, exactly. That's coming next, I'm sure. But, you know, I remember being a kid and, uh, you know, being told not to read things that were inappropriate for my age level or my reading level or whatever. And I always, I, I always think, you know, that's, I, I don't know. I'm against restricting kids' access to literature. <laughs> so you're I think corrupt the minds pretty... of our youth with poisonous, dangerous ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of your thing. It is. I guess it is. I guess I'm a little biased. I remember, remember Irvin's contest, and you said, you know, they might cheat on it. He said, only your students would cheat. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they get extra credit. That's right. Me too. You've corrupted you know? me too. It's all your fault. I had a bunch of teachers asking me about how to prevent teaching and how I thought the or prevent uh, cheating on tests and what I thought they should do to implement security controls and and how how to bust the cheaters and I'm thinking you know boy I'm really the wrong person to ask for that kind of advice. <laughs> They're using that horrible like eye tracking stuff, right? Yeah, and you know they really didn't like my answer of uh giving higher quality uh projects and assessments that <laughs> yeah. yeah. didn't like that <laughs> yep all right and so alan has got growing chip output yeah we've been talking a lot over the many months about how the u.s for various reasons is going to be producing more silicon more chips um and so here's a very interesting interview of the founder of TSMC, Morris Chang. Uh, it's a YouTube video um, with uh, Brookings and the Center for Strategic and International Studies written up in the register. And the Chang has a number of very interesting observations to make about chip manufacturing in the US. It's not that there isn't any chip manufacturing in the US. I think it's like 14% of global output comes from the US and most of Intel's operations are in the US after all. But TSMC up to this point has not done much in the US. They have had a plant in Oregon for 25 years, but it's only much, much more recently between concerns about a, an invasion of Taiwan by China and also US government pressure that TSMC has announced plans to build another, at least one more fab in Phoenix, Arizona. And what Chang says, and he's no longer running the company that he founded, but uh, he's still, I guess, uh, at least a symbolic figurehead. Um, what he says is that running a fab in the US is very expensive and that labor costs are much higher in the US than in Taiwan. And also the talent simply is not here. So it's very difficult for a chip fab to find good factory workers who can do this work successfully. And he, he observes that um, the US has excellent design talent, you know, the engineers who design the chips, um, whereas Taiwan and TSMC in particular have very little such talent at all. But when it comes to actual hands-on manufacturing, Taiwan has all the manufacturing talent, but very, very little of the, uh, but the US has very, very little of the, uh, the, um, the uh, manufacturing talent. So anyway, that's just um, some interesting qualifications, shall we say, about this new effort to shift silicon production to the US and that it's not simply a matter of dropping tens or hundreds of billions of dollars on new fabs. It's also that the costs are going to be higher 
and that the manufacturing talent is not uh, present here in the U.S., at least not right now. Well, I've got good news on that front. I have a reason to believe that a whole bunch of people in Taiwan would probably really be happy to move to the U.S. pretty soon. Yes, and there has been some talk about that too, but that's going to be a lot of people required for yep. all of these new fabs, a lot of people. Well, I think a lot of people are going to want to leave Taiwan pretty soon, don't you? I don't know. I mean, uh, well, I think uh, China has made it pretty clear they're planning to invade anytime soon. Yeah, I, I suppose it all comes down to geopolitical uh, winds. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah. All right. And so um, Russia has now invaded Belarus, or to be more exact, a bunch of mysterious explosions have occurred in Belarus, which is how they start. They make false flag activities in Belarus, which they will then say is the Belarusian Nazis killing the innocent Russians in Belarus, and then they'll invade. So like they say, Putin seems to have figured out that he's not winning much in Ukraine and moving on to step two, invading Belarus. And so we really are slowly warming up to World War III here. And he's, uh, the Russians have been more and more angry saying, you know, if you guys keep giving all these weapons to Ukraine, we're going to start a nuclear war. So then what will you do? And um, in fact, everyone stepped it up. The U.S. keeps dumping more and more. Germany has been the holdout, but Germany just started supplying heavy weapons to Ukraine. They've been uh, dragging their feet and trying not to do it and trying not to live up to their promises, but they just shipped uh, 50 anti-aircraft tanks or something in. So um, this, this proxy war where the um, Ukrainians do the fighting and the rest of NATO just gives them tons of guns is growing and increasing. And but I did see one analysis here, which might, I, I always wonder, what is the end game? Because we're not going to get rid of Putin. But what they say is we're hoping to degrade Putin's army so much that for a generation, we don't have to worry about him anymore. And I guess maybe you could achieve that. But um, uh, the question is, can you achieve that without him bothering to use all of his weapons, including the chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons that he's sitting on? Anyway, um, for better or worse, it the, seems uh, to it heating kinda, up. Yeah, it kind of seems like uh, uh, it's all. Some of the tactics have also been to make things so miserable for uh, the powerful in that society that they they depose him. But I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Yeah, I think this is an American dream. See, over here in America, the people have a lot of power. In those countries. The people do not have a lot of power. They keep saying that is not all the experts I read say that is totally not in the card. Everybody would love it if somebody would just overthrow Putin, but they say that is not going to happen. There are defenses to prevent that. And so that's why if we can't get rid of Putin, then I wonder what we're doing and why we're doing it. When he fired his whole staff and replaced them. Uh, and immediately I thought, well, that if there is ever a chance this would be it. And well, it he's didn't imitating. happen. Yeah, this is what Stalin did. Stalin killed tons of his own people. He was constantly suppressing like people that might revolt against him. And Putin is on the same playbook. So is the leader of North Korea. I mean, these dictators know how to stay in power by constantly watching for anybody who is not loyal and crushing them the way Trump is always trying to do, although less violently. That's what you do when you're a dictator. Anyway, um, the thing continues to heat up and who knows how far it's going to go. So we're back to Caitlin with Lapsus. Yes. Uh, so Emma Roth has an article on The Verge talking about Lapsus and the T-Mobile breach. So Lapsus is considered a you know super mastermind hacky group of teenagers who do these amazing hacks. And we finally have some details about how they got into T-Mobile. And just the hacking skill is amazing. So here's what they did. Are you ready? They bought credentials. Yeah, that's right. That's what they often do. They just offer to like pay you for your login. Yes. That's not a bad attack. That's a great attack. It's a great attack. It's hard yeah, to but that, 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 was the, that was the mastermind. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> right there. Like a decade ago, I got in a fight with Lulzek back then when I said, you know, um, the, so, the structure of human society is also a system and hacking it is a perfectly good skill. This is social engineering. Yes, it is. Uh, so that was, that, was, that was how they got in. And of course, what you can do with 
getting to T-Mobile systems is you can get to get to some of the systems that handle the SIM data and you can do SIM swaps and you know use people's 2FA. Um, they attempted to try to crack the FBI and Department of Defense T-Mobile accounts. They failed uh, because there's some extra security on those. Well, good. Um, I would hope so. You would hope so. So that was good. So actually, I have a bit more faith in T-Mobile now. Um, but that was that was the attack. They bought, they bought creds. That's how they got in. <laughs> well, you know, every CEO ought to be asking, couldn't that happen to us? And what could we do about it? Yes. Yes. And just as a reminder, people, um, if you get hacked, if you're a big company like T-Mobile, you get hacked. No one cares if you come forward and you're like, I got hacked. T-Mobile came forward. They, you know, we know they got hacked. Uh, if you try to hide it, then we care. Okay. Yeah. Then that tells us much. That tells us much more about your company uh, than whether or not you got hacked. Because things like this happen, right? Like you can be a very careful company, and then some people, some teenagers buy creds. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know no one's no one's. I mean maybe T-Mobile should implement some 2FA moving forward, and maybe get some some more stringent uh, stuff going on. But they, I mean they detected the unusual logins. They they managed to mitigate it. So you know. Yep. No, it's much better to come clean. Come clean. Yes. All right. And so Liz has got a heat battery. What is a heat battery? This is pretty cool. I uh, saw this article from um, a uh, publication from the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, and uh, they are working on some really cool technology. It's actually well, but rolled out for uh, testing in, in homes uh, in Europe. Uh, and it's it's this, it's essentially a giant salt cell battery where um, heat is generated by uh, slowly dripping um, water into salt. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting uh, how this works and it could be, it could it could really change the reliance on uh, natural gas uh, for um, heating your house and heating water and stuff. So I am it's really exciting. I hope it I hope it uh, becomes scalable um, and useful because it could really not just it was really. Um, accelerated this project was really accelerated by the war in ukraine and how uh, much of western europe depends on russian natural gas but um this could also have some some good uh implications for um the uh climate crisis uh so i hope that it hope that it becomes um useful consumer technology well this is essentially how dry cells work right they've got they've got a chemical reaction which takes place from the electricity and then you reverse it to suck the electricity out again. Yes. There's a bunch of ways. I remember one old trick that was fine. If you want to store energy, you just lift a rock and then you let it fall and get the energy out of it. Yeah. Right. So, so this would be really great for house heating. You can just, there's no conversion of energy, right? You just take the heat from the battery, you release it into the house. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I'm wondering about is that they're calling it a battery and not like a heat storage unit which sort of implies that there's going to be an electrical component. Now, converting heat to electricity is absolutely possible. The problem is that there's a huge loss involved. Uh, like if you want to do it directly, you're going to use something like, um, I, uh, I forgot what they're called. There, there's those little plates that get hot and cold. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. thermoelectric. Thermo, yeah, thermoelectric uh, generators. Um, but they're uh, uh, Peltier coolers, that's what they're called. Uh, you can use something like those to generate electricity straight from a heat source, uh, but they're still not that efficient. Yeah. Um, and so if they want to actually use this to store like electrical energy, I'd like to see their solution uh, to do it efficiently. Somehow they it's claim this stores to the heat. This never has electricity. It just stores heat directly, which right. is dodging all that. Somehow right, they right. managed they claim that this is completely loss free. So I'm not really sure how that's possible, but uh, if, if it's, it's, if it's just storing heat to be used as heat, then that would be hundred percent efficient. Well, and that's the point. It does make sense. You put water in the salt and the salt gets hot. And then when you have heat, you heat up the salt and it drives the water out again. So I see what they're saying. Um, yeah. I'm sure you could argue in practicality of loss, but 
uh, you don't get power from nowhere though. And you do need fairly intense heat to heat it up. So it seems like you would still need like a gas furnace to heat it up to boil the water, to boil the water out of it. So it doesn't seem to me that it lowers your dependence on natural gas. You have to have energy from somewhere, but I guess you could have a solar device or something heating up the salt. Yeah, that's actually yeah. one one trick that um, some older solar power plants use. Instead of having a bunch of solar arrays around a big area, they would actually just use mirrors, point the mirrors at a single point that would get white hot um, yeah. and then generate the heat from, you know, boiling water or something off of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so definitely that that's possible. But it, it reminds me of those things where you have these space heaters that are like, they claim to be like 99.9% .9 efficient, which is absolutely true. But they still take like you know two thousand watts, you know, because mm -hmm. all the all the waste uh, all the waste energy goes to heat anyway. So it is technically one hundred percent efficient, but I mean it's still using a lot of power. And mm -hmm. yeah. well, anyway, it's useful technology to think about. All right, and that's it for this one. We'll be back on Friday. <laughs>